Today, we're going on a journey in search of joy in practice. And we want to ask our innovators, how did you do that? How did you create a model of care that is attractive and effective in primary care? We'll be talking about what, why did we choose joy in practice as the particular lens with which to uh, look at primary care. And we'll talk about what we did in the site visits and what we learned. And we'll be focusing on what we uh, found as the threats to joy in practice and then some of the innovations that uh, we found that helped to restore joy in practice. And then at the end, Rachel will lead us in a conversation about, well, how do these uh, thoughts and how does this work fit into the larger improvement work of the patient-centered medical home? It's estimated that 30 to 40 percent of physicians in the U.S. are burned out. And that physician burnout poses a potential threat to successful implementation of the good ideas of health care reform. When we're burned out, we make more mistakes. Our patients don't adhere to our treatment recommendations as much when we're feeling burned out. And patient satisfaction goes down. 21% of general internists leave their practice within a few years of board certification, as opposed to only 4% of our subspecialty colleagues. And why is that? Well, because it's a chaotic work environment, uh, not having any control over the work environment being sort of a pawn in a large organization but not being able to impact your work's workflow. And then just the overall sense of burned out. Well, medical students are certainly taking notice and they are turning and going the other way, choosing any specialty other than primary care. In fact, in 2010, only 9% of U.S. medical students uh, selected careers in either general internal medicine uh, or family medicine. And we know that we need a much more robust primary care workforce to have increased quality and lower cost if we're going to have a um, surviving healthcare system as time goes on. So what we did is uh, one or another of us visited um, each of 23 sites and these represented academic sites, academic medical centers, private practices, FQHCs, some were urban, some were rural. We tried to get a, a geographic distribution. And the challenges that we found as we went th through those site visits were chaotic visits with overfull agendas, inadequate support to do the work, vast amount of time spent on documentation and complying with regulatory and administrative requirements, EHRs that pushed more work to the physician, and then teams that functioned poorly. So I'd like to highlight a few innovations under each of those challenges. So chaotic visits with overfull agendas. First, let's hear from a few physicians. This is from Susie Penn, who was a previous ABIM board member. She practices here in Philadelphia. I'm always multitasking, entering orders, checking labs. It requires sort of a chronic hypervigilance, which is exhausting and tends to pull you out of the present with the patient. I spend several minutes with each appointment, rifling through the chart, looking for the last mammogram and colonoscopy. And then I spend less time on the patient's main, main concern. This was a family physician in Wisconsin. And this is a Minnesota family physician. Prescriptions are killing us. My nurse is spending so much time on refills that we can't seem to get anything done. So the innovations that I'd like to highlight that uh, we found include um, pre-visit planning, one type of pre-visit planning called pre-appointment lab, and then prescription management. So here is um, an MA at Fairview, and she's doing a pre-visit call. So at Fairview, um, MAs make a call to the patient a couple of days before their appointment. And they do this in the small moments of time, the uh, downtime, uh, as the day goes on. And they do that to unload, then, the work at the time of the visit. So they'll call the patient to find out what's the patient's agenda, so they aren't caught off guard by a, a another agenda item that the patient has. They do medication review. They do, um, all other patients are screened for certain conditions, including a depression screen, so they'll do that over the phone. Um, and they'll also have a conversation about advanced directives, and then they'll uh, document that all in the electronic health record to get that visit uh, documentation going. At Mayo Red Cedar, uh, the staff arrange for the lab, the patients to come to the lab a couple of days before the appointment. <coughs> so, and this is one of those simple things, but it's revolutionary because then when the patient is there for their visit, the patient and the physician and the lab results are all there at the same time. 
And so that allows shared medical decision making because the patient and the physician can discuss the results and make the next steps together. It also eliminates a lot of waste because that eliminates about two hours of post-appointment results reporting for every four hours of clinic work because you can do it in a much more efficient manner when the patient's there. At Theta Care, uh, the approach is this. The patient arrives at the clinic, the blood is drawn, and there's 15 minutes to get that, blood re that lab result back into the examining room. And they have then done a lean process to get that system to work. And this again means that the patient and the physician have the lab results when they are together face to face. Several of our uh, sites have learned that taking a systematic approach to prescription renewal uh, saves quite a bit of time. And I don't think I can emphasize enough the amount of waste in the U.S. healthcare system that's around prescription renewals. At a minimum, I think it's about 30 minutes of physician time a day that's wasted on this and an hour or two of nursing time wasted. And when you think of that across all of primary care, that's a lot of resources that can be redeployed to higher value medical home kind of functions.